I'm Jane. I had just turned 28 when I thought I met the love of my life, Mike, and everything happened so fast. We were married within a year of meeting. Mike is an accountant, tall, with a laugh that could light up any room. I work in digital marketing, love to paint on weekends, and I have always been more of a planner. We balanced each other out, or so I thought. It was the day after our wedding, and our living room was piled high with wrapped presents and envelopes. There was a chaotic beauty to it all, the remnants of our celebration. That's when Mike's parents, Carol and Dave, dropped by. I hadn't really gotten to know them since we got married so quickly, but they seemed all right, normal even. As we started opening gifts, I noticed Carol and Dave were more than just a little interested in the contents. Is that a crystal vase? Carol asked, picking up a shimmering piece that my aunt had given us. She turned it over in her hands, eyes gleaming. Yeah, it's from my Aunt Linda. Pretty, isn't it? I said, trying to nudge her attention away from claiming it. Before I knew it, Carol had placed it in a separate pile to the side. I think we can find a good place for this at our house, she said nonchalantly. Mike didn't seem to notice, busy untangling a set of fancy kitchen gadgets from his cousin. I shot him a look, hoping he'd say something. Mom, that's our wedding gift, Mike finally said with an easy smile, as if it was all a big joke. Oh, come on, it'll just collect dust here. We'll use it, Dave chimed in, wrapping an arm around Carol. Besides, you two are young. You'll get plenty more gifts over the years. I tried to laugh it off with them, but it felt off. Actually, I was thinking it would look great in our foyer, I said, attempting to claim it back without causing a scene. Carol looked at me, her expression a mix of surprise and annoyance. Jane, you need to learn to share. We're family now, and families help each other out, she said, her tone firm, as if she was teaching me some sort of lesson. Mike, catching the tension, quickly jumped in. Let's not worry about this now. We've got plenty of gifts, right, Jane? I nodded, biting back my words. But as they continued to sift through the gifts, setting aside a few choice items for themselves, that uncomfortable feeling settled deep in my stomach. It was like watching strangers claim parts of my life as their own. And Mike, well, he just let them. Our first year of marriage flew by, and before I knew it, our anniversary had arrived. I wanted to make it special, a celebration of us. So I booked a table at Shea Louis, a cozy little spot we both loved. I thought it would be romantic to have Mike's parents join us, you know, to show them they're important to us. As we sat down at the restaurant, Carol and Dave were already there, menus in hand. This place is fancy, Carol said, eyeing the chandeliers. Mike squeezed my hand under the table, a silent thank you for organizing it all. The waiter came by and we started to order. I went for the salmon, Mike's favorite, and I noticed Carol's eyes darting down the menu to the most expensive items. We'll have the lobster and the filet mignon, she declared, pointing at the priciest things without a second glance. Dave nodded in agreement. And why not throw in a bottle of your best wine? He added, winking at the waiter. I could feel my smile stiffening. Quite the celebration, huh? I tried to keep my voice light. Mike shrugged. It's a special night, he said. Let's not think about the cost tonight. The conversation was light for the most part, but I couldn't help but notice how Carol and Dave savored the food like it was their last meal, almost oblivious to the price tag I knew would come at the end. As we ate, I couldn't shake the feeling of being taken advantage of. It wasn't about the money, not really. It was the principle. It was our anniversary, and it felt like it was being hijacked. When the check arrived, I saw Mike's eyes widen a little, but he quickly recovered and handed his card to the waiter. On our way out, Carol looped her arm through mine. You know, Jane, this was just lovely. We should do it again next year, she said, a satisfied smile on her face. Thanksgiving was around the corner, and with it came the start of the holiday season. Mike and I had started to decorate the house, a mix of fall colors and early Christmas cheer. It was cozy, the kind of place you'd want to come back to after a long day. One evening, as we were stringing up some lights around the living room windows, Mike's phone pinged with a message. He read it and laughed, Oh, my parents are ahead of the game. They've already sent their Christmas wish list. I was untangling another set of lights and looked up. Wish list? Yeah, they send one every year. 
helps with shopping, he explained, his fingers scrolling through his phone. Curiosity got the better of me. So, what's on this famous list? Mike hesitated, then handed me his phone. The list was extensive. Top-tier electronics, designer clothes, luxury items that they probably didn't even need. I scrolled through in disbelief. They can't be serious, I said. This is a lot. Mike took his phone back and shrugged. They like the good stuff. What can I say? I didn't know how to respond. There was a knot forming in the pit of my stomach. Mike's birthday was also coming up, and I'd been so excited to give him the watch he'd been eyeing for months. Now it felt like any gift would be less about us and more about fulfilling a list. When it came to us making our list, I couldn't help but feel petty making one at all. Maybe we should just ask for charitable donations in our name, I suggested half-heartedly. Mike laughed. Good one, but seriously, what do you want? You need a new laptop, right? The holidays rolled around, and I got Carol and Dave a nice coffee maker. Nothing too fancy but practical. They, in turn, gave me a set of scented candles. They were nice, but the difference was stark. I didn't say anything. Mike seemed happy with the fancy drone they got him, though. The unspoken rule was clear. We were expected to give big and receive small. It didn't feel right, but bringing it up only seemed to cause tension. So, I kept quiet, wrapping gifts and pasting on a smile for the holidays. But inside, I was beginning to count the costs, not just in dollars, but in the emotional toll this was starting to take. I was at my desk, staring at the computer screen when the email notification popped up. It was my quarterly bonus, bigger than I had expected. My first thought was to do something meaningful with it, something for Mike and me. So, I booked us a trip to Paris. We had talked about going since we met, and it felt like the perfect time to make that dream happen. That night over dinner, I told Mike about the surprise. His face lit up like I'd never seen before. Paris? Really? Babe, that's amazing! He exclaimed, getting up to kiss me. I was basking in the joy of the moment when his phone rang. It was his mom. I could tell by the way his face changed. Yeah, she booked us a trip to Paris, he said into the phone, and I knew I should have asked him not to say anything just yet. Mike's enthusiasm dwindled as he listened more and more. I know, I know you've always wanted to go. He trailed off, looking at me with a pained expression. I felt my heart sink. He hung up and there was a heavy silence. They want to come with us, he said finally, almost like he was asking for permission. I sat there, my fork halfway to my mouth, paused in midair. To Paris? With us? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Yeah. They said they've never been and always wanted to go, Mike explained, running a hand through his hair. I think we should take them. The room felt suddenly too small. It's supposed to be for us, Mike. Our trip. I said, feeling a tightness in my chest. He didn't respond at first, then. I know, but they're getting older, and I feel bad. They've done so much for me. I thought about all the one-sided gift exchanges, the anniversary dinner, and every other little thing that had piled up over the past year. But this is our time, I insisted, my voice firm. We can plan a trip with them another time. This bonus, it's for us. Mike sighed a deep, frustrated sound. They won't understand that. You know how they are. And you know how hard I've worked for this, I said, the words like stones in my mouth. I want us to enjoy it together, just us, like we planned. Mike didn't say anything for a while. Then, okay, we'll tell them some other time might work better. But when the time came to tell them, Mike's words faltered. Look, maybe we can all go together next year, he offered but Carol was having none of it. Why next year? We can afford it now, she retorted over the speakerphone, her voice laced with disappointment. I couldn't take it anymore. Because this trip is for us, Carol, Mike and I. We need this time together, I said, unable to hide my frustration. There was a pause, then Carol said, well, that's very selfish of you, Jane. Very selfish indeed. After the call, the air between Mike and me was tense. He was torn, I could tell, but this was one thing I wasn't willing to budge on. Paris was meant to be a dream trip for us, 
and I wasn't going to let that dream be taken away. Mike became a shadow in his own home, leaving early for work and coming back late. Our conversations dwindled to monosyllables. Dinner's in the oven, I'd say when I heard the garage door open, my voice echoing off the empty walls. Thanks, he'd reply, a hollow word that hung in the air between us. I missed him, missed us. I yearned for the easy days when we'd dream together on the couch, our plans and laughter intertwined. I longed to reach out to him, to break through the invisible barrier that had erected itself after the argument over Paris. But every attempt felt like speaking through a thick glass wall. I could see him, but I couldn't reach him. One particularly hard evening, I sat at the dinner table across from Mike, the sound of his fork against the plate drilling into the silence. I cleared my throat. Mike, this can't go on, I started, my voice barely above a whisper, fearful of shattering the fragile peace. We need to talk about what happened. We can't let this... This silence be the new normal for us. Mike continued to eat, his expression unreadable. Then he set down his fork, a sign that I had his attention, even if just for a moment. What do you want me to say, Jane? He asked, a hint of weariness seeping through. I want to understand why you're taking this so hard, why it feels like you're choosing them over me, I replied, the hurt evident in my tone. He sighed, his hands folded in front of him. They're my parents, Jane. They've been hoping to go to Paris their whole lives. And what about what we've been hoping for? Our plans? Our dreams? My own frustration started to bubble up, words becoming more pointed, desperate to bridge the gap between us. Mike ran a hand through his hair, a gesture of exasperation I'd come to recognize. I know, I know, he said, and for a moment, I saw the flicker of the man I married, conflicted and torn, but not indifferent. It's just, they've always been there for me. I feel obligated, you know? But where does that leave us, Mike? I pressed, leaning forward, trying to catch his eye. What about our marriage? He didn't respond right away, and in that pause, I felt a wave of fear. Fear that maybe we weren't as solid as I had believed, that maybe the foundation we had built was less rock and more sand, easily eroded by the steady tide of his parents' needs and wants. It's supposed to be us against the world, Mike, not me against you and them, I said quietly, my voice steady despite the emotion welling up inside me. He looked at me then, really looked at me, and I could see the conflict warring within him. I know, Jane, I just don't know how to make everyone happy. That's just it, I said a sudden clarity washing over me. We can't. We can't always make everyone happy. But we made vows to each other, Mike. Doesn't that count for something? He nodded slowly, his gaze lingering on the table before finding mine. It does. It counts for a lot. The rest of the meal passed in a contemplative silence, a change from the strained quiet that had become our norm. It was as if my words had planted a seed or perhaps watered one that had been lying dormant within Mike all this time. The morning sun poured in through the windows, but the warmth it usually brought seemed to have no place in our home today. I woke up to an eerie quiet, the other side of the bed untouched from the night before. The emptiness of the house felt like a heavy blanket, suffocating in its silence. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I reached for my phone, expecting the usual absence of messages given the silent treatment that had taken residence in our home. Instead, my screen was flooded with notifications, all from my bank. A lump formed in my throat as I read the details. Multiple transactions, including airline tickets and a pair of hotel bookings in Paris, all made while I was asleep. The timestamps on the emails told me the flight would have left hours ago. Mike and his parents were already on their way to Paris, using my hard-earned bonus to fund a trip I was meant to be on. Disbelief turned to anger, and then to a crushing sense of betrayal. I sat there, the phone heavy in my hand, as the reality settled in. Mike had access to my account. I'd trusted him implicitly, never imagining he would abuse that trust. Yet, here it was in stark black and white, a digital paper trail of deceit. I couldn't breathe, couldn't think. The one person I had believed would stand by me had chosen his own comfort over our relationship. I thought back to all the times I'd brushed aside the little signs, the excuses I'd made for him, 
for us. With trembling fingers, I dialed his number, knowing full well he wouldn't answer, not with the time difference, not with my previous ultimatum ringing in his ears. Mike, I began, the beep of the voicemail almost mocking in its cheerfulness. I saw the charges. You took your parents to Paris with my bonus. I don't even know what to say, but I hope it's worth it. I hope it's worth everything. The house felt even emptier after the call, the walls closing in on me with the weight of everything unsaid, and now, perhaps, never to be spoken. I sat at the kitchen table, the silence a stark contrast to the chaos raging within me. They had left, just like that, with no regard for me or the life we were supposed to be building together. I canceled the hotel rooms, the return flights, every piece of the trip that was connected to my finances. With each cancellation, I felt a piece of my old life fall away, the future I'd envisioned evaporating before my eyes. By the time I was done, there was nothing left to do but act. I contacted the bank and removed Mike's access to my accounts, a finality in each click that felt both terrifying and liberating. The man I had married, the family I had tried to be a part of, they were all just strangers now. Strangers who had used me, who had seen my generosity as something to exploit rather than cherish. I packed my bags with a robotic efficiency, each item a reminder of a dream I had to put away. There was no going back from this, no gentle words or apologies that could mend the rift that his betrayal had caused. Mike had chosen his path, and in doing so, he had set me on mine. The ring I'd once worn with pride lay cold and heavy in my palm. I set it down on the counter, its sparkle mocking in the morning light, and with one last look at the life I was leaving behind, I closed the door on the house that was never truly a home. It was late afternoon when I finally left the house. My car was packed with clothes and essentials, a stark reminder of the sudden turn my life had taken. As I drove, the messages began to flood in, one from Mike, several from his mother. I pulled over to read them, knowing they'd only fuel the fire of my resolve. Mike's message read, Jane, please, we need to talk about this. Can't we just discuss it? His words seemed hollow, almost insulting in their simplicity. I started to type a response, then stopped. No words would bridge the chasm between us. His mother's messages were a mix of confusion and anger. What's going on? Why have you canceled our rooms? Call me. I imagined her sitting in a cafe in Paris, expecting luxury and finding complication. I turned the phone off. They were in the middle of a trip funded by deceit. They could figure it out. My first stop was the bank. I needed to ensure my finances were completely secure. The bank manager, a middle-aged woman with a gentle face, greeted me. I need to make sure all my accounts are locked down. My husband, he won't have access anymore, I explained, my voice steady despite the emotion I felt. Of course, she nodded, offering a sympathetic smile. Let's make sure you're protected. By the time I left the bank, my accounts were secure, and a new sense of determination settled within me. I drove to my sister's house, the only place I felt I could go. She opened the door before I could even knock. Jane, I've been so worried, she said, pulling me into a hug. I allowed myself a moment to just be held, to let the reality of my situation be shared. I can't believe he would do this to you she said as we sat down at her kitchen table. You deserve so much better. I nodded, swallowing hard against the lump in my throat. I do, and that's why I'm not going back. I've canceled everything. I've left the house. I'm done, Sarah. She reached across the table, squeezing my hand. Good for you. What's your plan now? I looked around the familiar room, feeling the first twinge of relief. I'm not sure yet but I'm starting with a divorce. I can't stay married to someone who has so little respect for me. Sarah's face was a mixture of anger and pride. I'll support you however I can. Do you need a lawyer? I'll find one, I said, my voice growing firmer with each word. I need someone who doesn't know Mike or his family. I need this cut clean. The conversation shifted as Sarah helped me unpack my car and make plans for the next few days. There was a strange comfort in the mundane tasks, a grounding in the midst of chaos. I was standing in the kitchen at my sister's house, 
a mug of coffee warming my hands when my phone vibrated with a persistence that felt all too familiar. It was Mike, again. Jane, we need to talk. I'm sorry, I miss you, and I think we can work things out. His text read, a mixture of apology and plea. I sighed, the same rehearsed, I'm sorry, becoming a threadbare blanket that no longer provided comfort or warmth. Not this time, Mike, I muttered under my breath, typing a response that left no room for ambiguity. There's nothing left to discuss. Please respect my decision. I could almost hear the desperation in the silence that followed, but it wasn't enough to make me reconsider. Not anymore. My resolve was tested further when, a few days later, Mike's parents made a dramatic appearance at my sister's doorstep. Their faces were twisted in anger as they barged past Sarah, who stood wide-eyed at the door. You've got some nerve, Jane, his mother exclaimed, her voice shrill. You ruined our family vacation. You're just a greedy, selfish woman. Sarah stepped between us, her stance protective. That's enough. You're not going to come into my house and insult my sister. The argument escalated until the neighbors peeked out of their windows, and I was sure someone would call the police. It ended with Sarah threatening to do just that if they didn't leave. Their departure left a sour air that lingered long after they were gone. But amidst the chaos, a realization settled within me. I was truly done. The divorce process was a cold, legal ballet, and I danced my part, signing papers and nodding through explanations of settlements and divisions. But with each stroke of the pen, I felt a chain breaking, a tether loosening. And then it was over. I stood outside the courthouse, a free woman. The air was crisp, a gentle wind playing with the loose strands of my hair. Sarah hugged me tight, her support unwavering. You did it, Jane, she whispered, pride evident in her voice. I had done it. I had stood up to the selfishness that tried to claim me, stood firm against the manipulation that sought to keep me bound. I turned away from the courthouse, away from a past that no longer held me. The messages from Mike continued for a while, a mix of apologies, bargaining, and eventually anger. But they went unread, floating in the digital void as I moved forward with my life. The apartment I rented was small but bathed in sunlight. I filled it with plants, books, and new memories. I went back to school, enrolling in classes that fueled a passion for learning that I'd neglected. And one quiet evening, as I sat on my little balcony, a cup of tea in hand, I deleted Mike's number from my phone. I was free. Free to heal, free to grow, and most importantly, free to be unapologetically me.